We have all been uniquely and lovingly created in the image of God and called to live in fusion with Him and with one another. I'm Robert Richard Ellis, and welcome to The Converging Zone. Welcome to The Converging Zone. Many of you have heard of the Calvary and Vineyard church movements. Today, my guest, Chuck Smith Jr., was a part of it at the beginning, is coming here to share with us what was it all about, how did it get started, and where we are today. Welcome to, to the uh, Converging Zone, Chuck Smith Jr. Chuck, Robert. good to see you again. We got to spend time together just last weekend at our, at our friend's house at, at, at uh, uh, Glory Tabernacle in Long Beach. So it's good to see you so soon uh, just after that event. Yeah, and, and you know, Robert, I really enjoyed the way we hit it off right away. as like uh, we, we'd known each other for a long time. Yeah. Isn't that something when you first meet someone, you're going, uh, he's the new part of my journey, but you know that it's going to continue. Yeah. So welcome to our journey together. Um, Chuck, you know, talking about the vineyard and the, the, the Calvary movements, many of us uh, in the audience uh, all over the world um, have been touched by these church movements, by these pioneers that cut the way for many people that have uh, brought uh, life to us, that brought Christ and a, a greater expression of Jesus into our lives. I've got personal mentors that were cut right into the, from, the, from the vineyard movement or the Calvary movement. Uh, it's amazing to me to see what God did really in a, a, a short period of time to bring this around the world. How did this all begin? Tell us about this, this Calvary Vineyard uh, explosion. Well, you know, it's, it's amazing to me also, and it was amazing to my dad. I think that's, that's really important to note. Um, there was a time when his church was between facilities. They had outgrown one and they're trying to construct another and while they were waiting for that to be constructed they met in a circus tent it seated 2,000 people they thought you know at last we'll have room for everyone within a month they were having three services and they were filling up the tent each service um, but one Sunday night after service uh, dad and I were, were walking away from the tent everyone else had cleared out it had been a wonderful evening we turned around and it was just classic. There was a full moon hovering over the tent. And he said, would you have ever thought that God would do something like this in our lives? I mean, he said our, but he really meant, I mean, his. And he said, it's, it's just the grace of God. You know, ministers and church leaders, Christian leaders had come to look at Calvary Chapel and find out the secret, you know, what's your method? What's the, what kind of programs do you run? And my dad would say, it's just the grace of God. And he wow. really meant that. I mean, he, he didn't understand why. I mean, if there's a sociology to it, he didn't come into it that way. Yeah. Um, my dad pastored uh, mostly small churches, um, beginning in Prescott and then in Tucson, where I was born and then back to California. And through a, a series of circumstances, landed in Huntington Beach, California. And he had, at that time, a backlog of 100 sermons. So he figured, I can be anywhere at any church for two years and have all the sermons I need for my tenure there. Yeah. And then, hopefully, Lord willing, because he was part of a denomination at the time, they'll move me on, and uh, I can re-deliver my, my 100 sermons. Yeah. yeah. So uh, what happened is he really liked Huntington Beach. I think it reminded him at that time of growing up in Ventura, and he, he thought, I want to stay here. I better come up with some more sermons. And so... Uh, he started teaching First John, and he went into depth with it. He spent several months there, and um, he thought, wow, if I just keep teaching the Bible, I have an endless supply of sermons. Yeah. And that's when he started to become a Bible teacher. And for the first time, people were really drawn to his ministry. People have been drawn to my dad simply because he's a very charismatic person, but they were drawn to his ministry 
when he started teaching the Bible. So uh, years passed. We ended up in Costa Mesa, this very small church that he felt called to. And uh, we'd been there a while. How old were you at this time? I was just entering high school okay. at that time. Um, and we'd been there a while. The, the church w was a church of about 75 attenders. Um, not everyone was happy about my dad coming there, and it had uh, shrunk to 25, uh, mostly uh, three central families. Uh, and then after oh, two or three years, we started to see some significant growth. So it, so it stayed fairly small uh, at, the, at that time for yeah. three years. Wow. Yes, it, it would be like you know, an average church size in America. And then my mom, uh, around 1967, 68, started to feel this intense burden for the hippies that were traveling up and down the California coast, or the whole West Coast, from San Diego to Washington. And uh, they would congregate a lot around Huntington Beach, Laguna Beach. Uh, at the time, we lived in Newport Beach. We're you know, right in between these hippie meccas. And my mom would ask my dad to drive her down to the beach in the evenings so that she could go and watch them because she was fascinated. With their culture. With their culture, with their dress, you know, the whole bohemian style. I mean, this was so unheard of. You know, I mean, you know, think of um, people their age had come back from World War II and had all kinds of doors open to them uh, for college, for management positions. Uh, people were eager to hire these returning GIs. They needed an income. They were starting young families. Uh, and think of the IBM haircut, you yeah. know, and, and that, that model yeah. of suit and skinny tie. And all of a sudden, here's this countercultural movement where everyone is just out there doing their own thing. And my mom would weep because she would see her sons and daughters, I mean, you know, most of these people were close to my sister's age, my age, and she would think, where are their parents? Where are their families? You know, where are the people who should be watching over them? And uh, really, her heart enlarged for them. Now, my dad, what I remember my dad saying once in a while in the evening, okay, let's drive down to the beach and look at the freaks. <laughs> Yeah, I was like, why don't they get a haircut? Why yeah. don't they get a job? Yeah. Why, you know, why don't they take story. a bath? Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but she was seeing a whole different thing. She was seeing a whole different compassion. thing. compassion. Yeah. Exactly. Wow. And that enlarged his heart. And uh, he decided, you know, I'd like to meet a hippie. <laughs> you know, it's almost like, uh, you know, someone works at a lab and says, well, I'd like to meet one of those lab rats sometime. Yeah, you know, I'd exactly. like to see it. And uh, my sister had a boyfriend who said, well, I could introduce you to somebody because he had been involved in drugs before he uh, turned his life around. And he, at that time, he was at Vanguard University, which was then Southern California Bible College. Yeah. And uh, one day he's driving down Fair Drive. He sees this guy with long hair, long beard, uh, puffy sleeves, uh, embroidery down the side of his jeans, barefoot, and he, he, he's hitchhiking, and he has a Bible. And John pulls over, picks up this guy, brings him to our house. He, he, he starts talking with him about the Lord, brings him to our house. And uh, that young man was Lonnie Frisbee. Introduced him wow. to my mom and dad. They sat with him for hours. At the time, Lonnie was living in a commune in Novato, just above San Francisco. Uh, he ended up returning there, getting his wife Connie, moving down to Southern California with the, the sponsor. Lonnie and Connie, huh? Lonnie and Connie, yeah. Isn't that great? With the sponsorship of the church behind them. And they began talking to hippies on the street and introducing them to Jesus. And uh, pretty soon, the church was renting a house for them. Uh, called it the House of Miracles, and I'll tell you, um, every night it was packed with these kids from the street. Uh, I mean, 30, 40, 50 kids trying to cram into a living room, uh, say kids, young people, and um, they would, if they received Christ, 
they'd allow them to stay there for a week. And then after a week, they said, okay, now you have to go out and win some people to yeah. Jesus. Go find some place to live. So these, one week discipleship what, program. Yes. <laughs> it was crazy. Yeah. But you see. But God was in it. Exactly. Wow. And, um, and the hippies had moved outside of culture. And right about this time, 68, 69, the the whole dream of the hippie movement collapsed. You know, uh, the Stones uh, had a concert in which they hired the Hells Angels for security. They killed a guy. Uh, Rolling Stone magazine published an article that said, our innocence is dead. Wow. Uh, for the first time. The fun is over. Yeah. Organized crime moved into San Francisco. Um, that brought all kinds of problems. It wasn't this innocent return to nature, you know, this flight from the plastic society, yeah. from the establishment. Yep. Um, and so that these young people were out there and they needed to find a way, they, a way maybe to re-enter society yeah. or a way to construct a different kind of life. And when they heard Jesus and they heard it from passionate people who talked about Jesus as a personal friend who is engaged in their everyday life. And when they heard it in, in a biblical nuance, they, they just immediately glommed onto it. Wow. So it's like the new vision of utopia or paradise. Yeah. Only this one has some substance behind it and some history behind it. And wow. my dad's church has started filling up. You know, I want to, we're going to touch on this. I want to show a clip. You know, David DeSabatino uh, created a movie uh, on the, on the, uh, the uh, biography of, of Lonnie Frisbee's life. Um, and so, and what was the title of the, the, the movie that... that uh, I think it's just called Frisbee. Oh, Frisbee. Yeah. So we're going to watch a clip uh, uh, of, of your portion in the movie uh, talking about this guy named Lonnie Frisbee. So let's take a look at it right here. What does it mean that God placed his spirit on a, a homosexual in 1967? The same thing that it means when God placed his spirit on any of us when we turned our faces up to him and said, Oh God, please use us with all our heart we cry out to use us. Because there aren't any of us who have been used who do not wrestle with sinful issues in our lives. Uh, God was just, I believe, sending this clown God wanting to receive the glory is almost laughing in heaven in, in, in delight and joy at this silly little man with this silly beard doing these silly things. My dad made the announcement, if we have to turn away one young person because they're barefoot and their bare feet are going to ruin our carpet, then we'll pull out the carpet, remove the pews, we'll sit on the concrete floor. These kids have nowhere else to go to connect with God. If we turn them away, where do they go? Now, we can say that about drug dealing, free sex, rock and roll hippies, but not say that about homosexuals. If the church says to anyone, you cannot come here, you cannot engage in the life of the church to anyone, then where are they supposed to go to find Jesus? Long before the dawn had come, when darkness ruled and the earth was born, there was the word and the word was love. In Him was life. I think I tear up every time I, I watch that thing um, for so many reasons. Uh, you know, uh, and, and let's talk about this. We were at a church last weekend that uh, has a large population of homosexuals and, that the church would condemn and not want in their building. And yet here we see in Lonnie Frisbee a guy that God used in the midst of being a homosexual um, to sp spur on a movement and to give people hope where they had no hope but Jesus. Um, 
I love what you shared that. You know, where are they going to go? Right. Where else can they go? The church doesn't want them. Jesus says, come to me. And we all have issues. They had a different type of issue than we have. So anyway, tell us about this whole Lonnie Frisbee story in the sense of how this ignited the people there. Lonnie um, was very charismatic. And my impression of him was that he had an apostolic presence. It was, I mean, is very much as if you were walking with Peter or Paul. Uh, when he and Connie first moved down, they did not have transportation. In fact, they lived with uh, our family for a, a short term. But they'd need rides places, and they'd want to go to Laguna Beach and go street witnessing or Huntington Beach. So a lot of times, I was the driver. I was the chauffeur for them. And I enjoyed it. It gave me lots of time to talk to them and to learn uh, about their whole culture. And, uh, and I grew close to them. Uh, I felt close. I was young, a little bit younger, so I looked up to, to them. And one time, we were in Huntington Beach. Uh, Teen Challenge had a coffee shop on the corner of Main Street and Pacific Coast Highway, which was just classic for you know, uh, all the hippies that hung out at the pier, which was right across the street. And I walked up to Lonnie. Uh, he was witnessing to a guy on the, on the corner up the street a ways, and I walked up, and immediately this guy clammed up. And um, Lonnie said, it's okay, you, you can talk around him. And he said, he, he doesn't know. And Lonnie says, it doesn't make any difference. And the guy said, oh, yes, it does. And Lonnie turned to me, and he said, okay, before I came to Christ, I was involved in, in homosexual sex. And he turned away, he turned back to the guy, he goes, see, it doesn't make any difference. And I put on <laughs> this poker face. I'm like, you know, 17 years old, 18 maybe. And I put on this poker face and I go, yeah, it doesn't make any difference. And inside I'm thinking, oh, crap. You know, like, <laughs> yeah. It does make a difference. It's like, you know, what do I do with this information? Right. Um, my assumption, and, and at that time, my assumption was correct, that Lonnie was no longer engaged in those activities, that he saw them as sinful, um, whether he had temptations or not, I don't know, but that he had distanced himself from that. He had gotten married. I think that you know, all of this was a fight to be righteous. Yep. Um, and I think that's important to know about Lonnie because the situation today, like um, the conference we were at last yeah. week, these are gays and lesbians who accept their homosexual orientation. Lonnie never did. He um, fought against it. He fought against it. He always thought that it was sin. And as you begin to meet Christian gays and lesbians today, you'll find that there are at least three different categories. There are those who see it as sin, see homosexual sex as sin, not the orientation. You know, they can't help that they have same-sex attraction, right. but they see involvement as sin, and they seek to live celibate lives. And that's where Lonnie was. But then you have those who do not see it as sin and believe that God has called them to a monogamous same-sex relationship. So they're not into promiscuity. Right. And then there are those who are promiscuous. Right. And um, they don't take Scripture seriously regarding morality. Are they... So these are all in the camp of Christianity? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All of these would are right. those who claim to be Christians. Now, you need to think about this. The homosexual Christian, I mean, just... Think about that term and how alien that is to so many people. Right. They are in a no man's zone. Yeah. The homosexual community does not accept them. You know, they look at them like, what are you? Yeah. And the heterosexual Christian community does not accept them. You, know, you haven't repented. 
they really have no one, no, no body in society that embraces them as belonging to them, as, as part of them. They're really out there by themselves. And that's what broke my heart when I was there, when you were there. And that's why we were there, because um, God is, takes us where we are, all of us. And so we're not trying to convince anybody uh, what sin, not sin, it, interpret Scripture, however you want to interpret Scripture. But what we're saying is God is accepting them where they are. And, who, and we're to be His ambassadors, then who are we to not accept what God accepts? That's, that's, that's my understanding. I know that's your understanding. That, well, that's, how else can you put it? Exactly. That's Peter when he walked into uh, the house of Cornelius. You can hear this um, scrupulous Jew as he walks in saying, you know I'm not supposed to be here. Uh, a, a Jew's not supposed to enter the home of a Gentile. Here I am. The Holy Spirit told me not to call in clean what, what, what he's made clean. So... What do you want? Yeah. And they say, well, we, we want the story. And he starts telling the story, and the Holy Spirit comes on them. And uh, I think that that is maybe how some of us are, are dragged towards people that normally we would not associate with, uh, we would not think of as being a part of the community of Christian fellowship. Um, that we apologize for being there. You know, I really shouldn't be here. I don't know what I'm doing here. Why do you want me here? Uh, God, why do you want me here? And it's for the same reason, because people need to hear the story. And you know, Robert, um, I just feel uh, compelled to, to challenge you in this, in, in the converging zone. Yes. There's another way of looking at, at the converging, and that is, blessed are the peacemakers. Yes for they shall be called the children of God. That there's this camp over here and this camp over here, and someone has to come in between and say, let's make peace so that what this family has, they can share with this community. Yeah. And what this community has, you know, can reap the benefits of this the shared, shared oneness exactly. in him. Not in our, uh, what do you call it, preferences or our uh, similarities, but there's a strength in our differences. There's a synergy that comes uh, only by him in this, I call it a bridge or convergence or whatever you want to call it. You know, let's talk about this since we're here, and we'll, I want to get back to the story. But the moral majority in this country and around the world, but this country specifically, didn't work, uh, hasn't worked, will never work. And that's, what would you... You know, that's setting the boundary lines. This is right, this is wrong. This is right, this is wrong. We're right, you're wrong, end of story. No gap, the, the gap forever is there. No, there's, there's no, no inter, interaction. Right. What, what, what happened with this whole moral majority effort? Right. Well, um, what happened is what's typical of say, fundamentalist Christianity in the 70s uh, and 80s, which is namely, they were trying to turn back the clock. You see, the mo moral majority would have worked a century earlier, may even, maybe even a half century earlier. In fact, the moral majority was pretty much taken for granted at that time. But what had happened by the 70s and 80s is the youth revolution of the 60s. And that changed the face of America. That's when we entered a new era in American history, in, in world history for that matter. And the landscape had changed so much. And see, naturally, that frightened a lot of Christians who, and, and others who were not Christians, whose investments were in the old culture. Yep. We're in the, the old days. So, you know, there are many churches, even now, you can walk into, and it's like a time warp. Yeah. You know, it's, we're back in the days of, uh, you know, the Cleaver family, <laughs> or, uh, you know, uh, where mom and dad sleep in twin beds, yeah. twin separate beds, and yeah. there's, there's no hint of, you know, the real family dynamics. Yeah. Uh, it's all a very good face, yeah. you know, for 
what, who's out there. Um, but in this new era, the old, the old programs, the old thinking doesn't work anymore. Um, I've compared it to David going out against Goliath. And Saul said, you're going to fight that giant. You need some armor. And he gives him the best armor that Israel has, his own royal armor. And David puts it on, and he tries to move around in it. And he says, you know, I haven't ever really worked with this, and it's not my style. He removes the armor, and he's just a shepherd again. Now he's mobile. He can run against Goliath. And what happens is one generation of Christian leaders will say, well, I guess it's time to pass the torch. We want you to wear our armor. And if you're not going to wear our armor, we're not going to give you the torch. Yeah. So what, what happens is young believers are removed from their own culture, their own situation, and they're trying to wear someone else's armor and fight someone else's battle. Tell us how this Lonnie Frisbee character ushered in this movement. Well, it's important to remember that the late 60s was an apocalyptic time, you know, helter-skelter and that whole thing. The world was coming to an end. The world had come to an end for the hippie movement. And at the same time, Hal Lindsey's book, Late Great Planet Earth, was rising in the charts. And my dad was also teaching on biblical prophecy. So my dad was drawing a crowd of people really wanting to know about how Scripture connects with current events. Um, and Lonnie was given uh, Wednesday nights for like a youth meeting. And uh, that's where, when bands begin to emerge. Uh, you know, someone said, I can play guitar. A few people get together. And the next thing you know, rock and roll for Jesus was the new evangelism, is the new voice of the hippie movement uh, of those who are Christians. Um, Lonnie was very charismatic. I would say that his models of ministry would include uh, Catherine Kuhlman and Bob Mumford. Um, he did not have my dad's same, you know, biblical verse by verse teaching style. He was, he was very flamboyant. And I think that Lonnie's preparation to teach a Bible study was on the way there, he'd pray, God, please make something weird happen so I can build a, a sermon around it. And lots of weird things did happen. I mean, in those days, all the time, you could count on it. And he would spontaneously take that and turn it into a powerful message that was living right in that moment. Because wow. this is happening right now. And he'd take that and say, this is what the Spirit of God is doing right now. And when people would see that, it was like amazing. Wow. So he brought that in. Now, t tell us about some of the... Were there healings? Tell us about these things that, that would take place in these type of meetings. There are all kinds of things that would take place. Um, my mom has always been rather prophetic. One night in the middle of the night, I heard this blood-curdling scream come out of her and my dad's room. And in the morning, she explained that she had suddenly awakened and that three demonic faces came at her, you know, in vision or whatever. She just saw them coming at her, and it terrified her. And that's when she screamed. My dad woke up, calmed her down. They prayed together, went back to sleep. The next day, the report from the communal house, the House of Miracles, was that that night, someone had come into the house who was demon-possessed, and that they had cast three demons out of this person. I mean, it's just... You, you know, I, I put that in my weird file. This yeah. is weird. But there's, there were many things like that that happened that was just, it was of the moment. And it was an expression of the power of God. And Lonnie felt very comfortable in speaking the name of Jesus to issues that he <laughs> encountered and, and bringing the power of the Holy Spirit, you know, into now. You know, it takes we, a strange guy to embrace the strange of God or the seemingly mysteries of God. You know, I want to. We're going to move into another segment because we, we're. This is just too engaging to to, to fit into one show. So we're get, going to get the producers that give me the green light. We get to have another show. Right. Um, but before we do on this segment, uh, tell us the website. So, uh, Reflection Connection. Uh, uh, we'll put it on the screen too as okay. well. 
It's reflectionsc.net. Okay. Dot net. And do you, can they get your books on there? Uh, they can get uh, my books actually on Amazon.com. Amazon.com. And we'll talk more about the books later, but you've got to take a look at some of these books. They're pivotal. And you even got a book of dad. And That's the one that this show is about. You guys, you want to hear more of the details of what God did. Uh, the mem- a memoir of grace, Chuck Smith, by his son, Chuck Smith Jr. Thank you so much. We'll see you on the next segment. Great. Great.